So over the last couple of years, we've spent most of our time uh, walking through Luke's account of Jesus' life, the Gospel of Luke. We spent a lot of time in Luke. And over the course of the next couple of, of several weeks, this Lent season, we're going to actually finish, uh, finish Luke. We're going to have made it all the way from start to finish, every single verse, every single line that, Ru- that Luke wrote in his gospel. And I'm excited about that, and in some ways I'm a little nervous because this whole last section of Luke, this whole season of Lent, we're going to be in some of the most agonizing, the most treacherous moments of Jesus' life. And it can be a little, a little hard to take. If you guys remember oh, 20 years ago now, the, the movie that came out, The Passion of Christ, if you remember that, the movie was, was powerful, but it was hard to watch. So we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at the last moments of Jesus' life leading up to Easter. So I'm excited to be finishing up Luke. I'm excited to be looking at what Luke tells us about Jesus' passion. But I'm also a little afraid. A little worried. Well, pray with me. and We'll get started. Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this word that you've given us. It is a painful word. It pales in comparison to what you suffered. It's not easy. We pray that you would open your word to to our hearts, Lord, that any barriers that we have standing up in our minds or our hearts to, uh, to keep us from understanding what you would have us take from there, that you would just tear them down, Lord. Whether they're doubts, whether they're barriers that stand against uh, belief or hope, Lord, I pray that you would just show us your hope. Help us to believe. Help us to have faith. Help us to see you and your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I apologize ahead of time. I've started losing my voice this morning, so I'm going to drink a lot of water while I'm preaching today, and uh, just bear with me as I squeak like I'm going through uh, an 18-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old. So one day at the end of everything, we will stand before God. He will look at us. He will see us. He will see everything that we ever did or didn't do. Even more, he will see in our hearts and minds the way in which every single one of us, every single one of us, were in rebellion against him. He will see it all, and he will judge us. No wrong will be left unpunished. No act of injustice that has ever taken place will ever be allowed to slide, no act of violence, no oppression, no repression, no hatred, no jealousy, no greed, etc. Nothing will escape his notice. And it will be addressed. That should scare the living you know what out of us. It scared a Russian many, many years ago, Leo Tolstoy, I'm sure you all know who he was. You probably had to read something that he wrote uh, in high school. He was a Russian writer and born in 1847. He died in 1910. One of the greatest of the Russian writers, one of the greatest of the Russian authors. And he saw life in a real and dramatic way. And he lived a pretty rough life younger. A pretty heinous life if you read accounts of it. But later was converted to Christianity and became a pretty radical believer most of the nonviolence that gandhi espoused and martin luther king jr espoused came from some of the writings and teachings of leo tolstoy when he read jesus's teaching on the, the sermon on the mount and he saw the holiness of god he realized how high the bar 
was set for all of humanity. And it freaked him out. When Tolstoy read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he saw the challenge with keeping what Jesus taught. He saw it as something higher to which he should aspire. He saw what Jesus required and just how short he fell. When he read, give to everyone who asks, love your enemies, welcome persecution, he tried to live this way. He was a very wealthy man, a noble in the, in the Russian aristocracy, and he gave away everything. He gave all of his possessions away. Uh, he, he, he gave money to his servants and, and, and kind of freed them. He, 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 he signed away all the rights to his works that have sold millions and millions over the years. He gave everything away. Eventually his wife had to come to him and said, Hey, what are you doing? You've got 13 kids to feed and you're giving away all your money. Stop. But he was so sold out. He, he wanted to so live faithfully to what Jesus was calling him to. He agonized over, over all the things that that he could do to live this perfect life that Jesus was calling him to. If you read his diaries, the accounts in his diaries, they include account after account of trying to follow Jesus perfectly. He would devise rules for himself. And his diaries reveal over and over again just how often he failed to live by those rules. Over and over again he failed. He could never do enough. He was always aware of just how short he had come. How, how short he was to, to being close to what God demanded. And his life was torturous. He was a miserable man. And he died in deep angst, alone, and frozen. A.N. Wilson, a biographer of Tolstoy, writes this. He suffered from a fundamental theological inability to understand the incar incarnation. His religion was ultimately a thing of law rather than of grace. A scheme for human betterment rather than a vision of God penetrating a fallen world. With crystalline clarity, Tolstoy could see his own inadequacy in the light of God's ideal. But he could not take the further step of trusting God's grace to overcome that inadequacy. We live in a world where we are reminded constantly that history will judge us. Will you be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history? And we are encouraged to develop a set of rules to live by in keeping with that ideal. The problem with that is we will never know if we will be on the right side of history because the people who make that determination aren't even alive yet. We don't know what they will think or what they will value or what they will care about. We don't know what they will think we do that is stupid or wrong. And to live life in that way is to live under the same kind of pressure as Tolstoy. To live trying to follow a way or a bar, or a standard that we will never reach. It is a life of all law and no grace. It is a life absent God's love. It is a life worried about stepping out of line with those around us, and the pressure it creates to keep up a fake front, a facade of perfection, is enormous. And if not careful... We too can get trapped in seeing it as a, a scheme for human betterment. That this Christian faith is it's just a scheme to make us better and we miss God's grace. But our text this morning, it points us in a better direction. A direction that can free us from the unhealthiness of this pressure and this way of living. The Christian life, it is hard. It is difficult. It is demanding. Yet it is so 
incredibly hopeful and beautiful. Our text this morning, it's perhaps one of the most radical texts in all of the New Testament. Because it shows us a picture of one of Jesus' closest followers, Peter, as, com- as committing this, this heinous sin, this cowardly denial. But he wasn't just one of Jesus' followers. If, if that was it, if it was like Judas, who we saw um, at, on Ash Wednesday, it, if it was like Judas who betrayed Jesus and then kind of ran away and, was, you know, and died, committed suicide... We would have moved on past him, but this is, this is not just one of Jesus' followers, but this is a person who became a, a pillar in the early church, a leader in the early church, pivotal to what was going on in the first century. And I want to pause here just for a second to give us a little background about some things that will give us a, maybe a little more appreciation for just how radical this text is this morning. Most historical accounts, they smooth out the imperfections of their leaders, of their heroes. When you read Julius Caesar's The Gallic Wars, you have to take that with a grain of salt because Julius Caesar wrote that. And he makes himself look pretty darn good. But that's what happened when people wrote histories. They smoothed out all the imperfections of their heroes, all the imperfections of the people that they, they either had started movements or had ruled, and they made them look really good. But this account of Peter, this account of Peter is is told in all four Gospels. And nobody ever smooths anything out for Peter. Not a single one of the the people who wrote these Gospels sat down and said, Hey, this this account makes Peter look pretty bad. Let's Let's make him look a little bit better than he actually is. So there's this spotlight put on Peter. The Bible, it's the most printed, the most read book of all history. And his mess has been read by more people. And it's out there in front of more people than anybody else. And I'm thankful for that. Because we can learn so much from that. Three things we're going to hit today. We're going to look at when we fail to live up to God's expectations. That failure, sin, will affect even the best of us. So what do we do when it hits home? When we fail? And how do we recover? In Peter's case here in this text, we are shown unambiguously how much of a failure it is. I mean, just a little while ago, just hours, Peter swore That he would never leave Jesus. That he was his ride or die. That he was his homie. That he was going to walk with him through thick or thin. Peter says uh, this in Luke 22, 33. And I quote, Lord, this is Peter. Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Peter says that to Jesus just hours earlier. Peter was one of the very first disciples that Jesus called. He was... The one who left his nets and his family business to follow Jesus. He is the example of bold faith that we see and often want to emulate. He's a good picture of following Jesus at all costs. Peter is the first one to recognize who Jesus is. In Luke chapter 5 when he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, I am not worthy to be in your presence. He's the one who recognizes and confesses that Jesus is the long-awaited Christ. In Luke 9, he is one of the trusted three that Jesus pulls into a closer, tight-knit group. There's the 12 disciples, but then there were three that he spent a lot of time with. James and John and Peter. He, He affirms his undying loyalty to Jesus in Luke 22. And then, as we saw, if you were here during the Ash Wednesday service, when he when we saw Jesus being arrested in the garden. Peter is the one who draws the sword and begins chopping people's ears. Well, one person's ear. He tries to forcefully defend Jesus. And yet here in this moment, Peter fails. 
And what's so hard about this failure is it's multiplied. Three times he does this. Three separate instances when Peter is confronted with a chance to make it right. Each time he is given the opportunity to tell the truth and acknowledge Jesus. To tell the people what a horrible mistake that they've made. To defend Jesus. He doesn't. A Puritan commentator, I forget who it was, said that after the first time, Peter should have realized that being in that courtyard probably wasn't the best place for him to be, and he should have left. So he wouldn't have, he, you know, he made the first mistake, but he wouldn't have compounded his sin by doing it two other times. That he could have, you know, fled potential for more sin, more denial, but instead he stuck around. The first time we see a woman accuse Peter, in verse 56, she says, this man was with him. In verse 57, Peter said, woman, I do not know him. And then later, verse 58, you were also one of them. And Peter and Larry did that perfectly. Man, I am not. And then a full hour later, as we see in verse 59, certainly this guy was with Jesus because he's a Galilean. And Peter's response, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Three chances to do the right thing. And three times he fails. And on that third time, that third failure, the rooster crowed. Exactly how Jesus said that it would happen. And I'm not sure how it worked out, but in, the, in this process, during this time, Jesus is in a place where he can look at Peter, where he can see Peter, and Jesus in the midst of this denial, as he stands on the verge of the agony that he will face in coming days, he looks at, straight at Peter, and in that moment, wham, Peter remembers before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And it hits home in a way that crushes him. He is suddenly and completely faced with the way in which he has deserted his friend and his Lord. And Luke tells us that he went outside and wept bitterly. I remember the first time I was faced with knowing what God wanted for my life, and how far short I had fallen. It was a desperate and heart-wrenching feeling. There was no relief in sight. We all stand in that same place. God wants so much for us. But all of us resist Him. He calls all to such high and great things, but we all fail. That's what another Christian leader, the Apostle Paul, means in Romans 3 when he writes that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this truth comes crashing down on Peter. Peter fled and wept bitterly. It came crashing home in a way that forced him to see who he was. If he had any illusions, which I think he did, about himself being a brave and strong man, able to withstand the hardest of trials as he had told Jesus he would, then that has been dispelled. It has broken him down. Brought him to a point of grief and brokenness. Do you understand that? This isn't just Peter. This is all of us. Do you realize how broken you are? Do you realize how broken we all are? Peter's failure is clear for us to see. You may not have your sin or your failures put on blast like Peter had his put on blast, but all of us have it. It's all there. We all have it. 1 John 1, 8 says that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Each of us will fail. We cannot and we will not live up to what God wants in our life. Which 
brings me to the second point. What do we do with failure when it hits home? Many scholars and, and commentators point out Peter's weeping as that point when he was truly faced truly with what he had done, but also was truly sorry for what he had done. That he repents and seeks forgiveness for those failures. Now there are a number of things that Peter could have done. If he rationalized it, he could have said, well, I mean, what else was I going to do? If, if I said that I knew him, then they would arrest me and I couldn't do any good. They just would put me beside Jesus and I would suffer with him. This is my way of trying to, you know, work the system, find the loopholes. Or he could have said, I didn't, I didn't really sin in my heart. I might have said that I didn't know him, but in my heart I knew you, Jesus. I was with you in my heart. And I just told a little, couple little fibs. But how often do we do that? We rationalize our sin. Or we deny our sin. We say, I, that's not really a sin, is it? That's, that's not that bad. I, I did that because I had to do that. It's just a little loophole. But Peter, when he's faced with it, when Jesus looks at him, it crushes him. He doesn't weasel out from it. He doesn't say there's not, he didn't do anything wrong. He faces it. He had no excuses. He faced it and he was broken and he grieved over his failure. How do you react? Do your failures grieve you? Do they break your heart? Do you weep bitterly over them? Often the fear of admitting that we were wrong or that we failed can keep us from owning any of our sin. We think in our minds, we get trapped in our mind that if everything looks okay, then I'll be all right. But scripture is clear. The call to repentance is very real. But we aren't just left in our sorrow and our grief. You know what happens when you're left in your sorrow and grief? That's Judas. We're not left there. We have something more. There's, there's a promise of forgiveness. Romans 3 tells us that we're all sinners, that we've all fall short of God's glory. But it also says that we are justified, that we are forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. John 1 8, verse John 1 8 says that if we claim to be without sin, that we are deceived, that we are a liar. But if we confess our failure, if we confess our sin, he will forgive us. So how do we recover? How do we recover when we fail? It's never an easy thing. It's hard. If you've ever failed when you, when you were supposed to be walking straight, or then you know how hard it is. You've let yourself down. You've let others down. There's pain and there's sorry. Your brokenness, it comes out. It's out there. And people have to deal with it. And you have to deal with it. And it's not neat. And it's a tough place to come out of. But you can come out of it. You have to trust Jesus. Bring it to him in confession. That's the beauty of this. He knows it anyway. He sees you. He looks straight at you. That scene when, when Jesus looks at Peter, he knows. In the midst of, this is crazy, in the midst of what Jesus is getting ready to go through. This thing that he knows he's heading towards. This, as he stands in front of these people who hate him. He, his, his eyes find Peter. He knows. He looks straight at you. Bring it to him. If you've never done that, you can do it right here today. You can pray in your heart, Lord, I am so sorry for my sin. My failures to live how you want me to live. I am so sorry, Lord. Lord, I trust in you, Jesus, to save me from my failures, and I want to follow you. That's what you can do if you feel that weight. And 
he will welcome you. No matter what. After Peter left in verse 63, we get a picture of what is about to happen to Jesus. He is blindfolded and he's mocked and he's hit. And they mockingly say, prophesy, who hit you? This is ironic because this whole passage is about a prophecy. A prophecy that Jesus saw and understood that Peter would fail him. He knew that Peter would betray him. He, he warned Peter of this very fact in Luke 22, 31 and 32. He said, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift all of you, all of the disciples, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. In the prophecy of his betrayal is also the expectation of welcome for him to be restored. When you turn back, you will be welcomed back. And you will be used to strengthen your brothers. Our lives aren't a surprise to Jesus. What we do, it doesn't catch him off guard. I feel like it, it, if each and every one of us, if we were with Jesus, he would tell us the very thing and the very ways we will fail him. The ways in which we won't live up to what he expects of us and what he has called us to be and do. And he would say that in your failure, while you are my enemy, I still walk to the cross. I lay down my life for you. He loves us and he wants us with him. That's the thing Tolstoy missed. And I love his writing. And his writing is beautiful, but he was a tortured, tortured person. And that's what he missed. He missed the fact that God is a forgiving God, a God who does judge rightly. His justice is perfect. But his love is also perfect. In Jesus Christ, we see for the first time where those two things can come together. In the cross, God satisfied both justice and love. God was so just and so desirous to judge sin that Jesus had to die. Peter's failure demanded judgment. But he was so living, or so loving, and so desirous of our salvation that Jesus was glad to die. When we stand before God at judgment, he will see all of the wrong that we've done. But in Jesus, we will be covered. The punishment, he's taken on himself. The reason that this account is included in all four Gospels is because it's true. One of the greatest leaders in the church failed Jesus. But this was a community that didn't have to, didn't have to ignore that, didn't have to smooth it over, but could acknowledge it and recognize it for what it was and understand that forgiveness was a part of it. And this changed the world. It can change the world. It can shape us to be people who can acknowledge sin and extend forgiveness toward each other. We don't have to hide or be crushed by the law. We will be joined together in this love that Jesus has for us. We can be bound together, not by all the things that are similar. Bound together despite our differences. And the grace of Jesus will pull us together. I want to close with this quote by D.A. Carson. Christians in community are never to give up on one another. Never to give up on a relationship. Never write off another believer and have nothing to do with them. We must never tire of forgiving or repenting. And seeking to repair our relationships. Matthew 5 tells us we should go to someone if we know they have something against us. Matthew 18 says we should approach someone if we know that they have something, if we have something against them. In short, if any relationship has cooled off or has weakened in any way, 
It's always your move. It doesn't matter who, who started it. God always holds you responsible to reach out to repair a tattered relationship. A Christian is responsible to begin the process of reconciliation regardless of how the distance or the alienation began. The reason there are so many exhortations in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together not because they form a natural co-location, but because they have all been saved by Jesus Christ and owe him a common allegiance. In this light, we are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. That is the only reason why John 13 makes any sense when Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Christian love will stand out and bear witness to Jesus because it is a display for Jesus' sake of mutual love among social incompatibles. We must never give up on each other or on the supernatural potential of Christian community. Jesus has brought incompatibles together. No wonder we often fight. We must strive to hold ourselves accountable to practice forgiveness and reconciliation. Our mutual love for one another is how the world will see who Jesus is. And we can find the strength for that in the forgiveness that we have found ourselves in our failures with Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Lord, we need help to do this. Please help us. Help us to understand how deep your forgiveness is, how deep your love is, how it works its way through every aspect of our life. Lord, when we fail, help us to be grieved by our sin. Help us to see it for what it is. That we fall short of you. But help us not to sit in that. Help us to be grieved by it and repent and confess and turn back to you, Lord. Help us to be a community of people shaped by this. Where we forgive each other. Where we ask for forgiveness. Where we love each other well. Even though we're very different. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.